Gospel of Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. It was the first written. It is uh, considered by secular historians to be the most accurate for that reason. I'm not saying that I would consider it that way. I think they're all equal in accuracy because I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. I'm just saying from a secular point of view, it, ha it is held in high regard and it is considered to be a very important historical document. It's uh, very close to the time of Christ himself. Uh, there is very little doubt that what Mark wrote down, he wrote down as uh, someone who was speaking to eyewitnesses, that this is actually what took place historically. There's very little argument about that, and from that perspective, it's an interesting text. It's also interesting because of what Mark doesn't say. You'll notice, for example, the way he begins his gospel. We are noticing that right from the very beginning, he does something that no other gospel does. He doesn't tell us anything about the the birth of Jesus. He doesn't mention anything about the story of Mary and Joseph and all that we recognize as our Christmas story. He jumps right in to the thick of things. As it were, he grabs for the throat. He goes for the most important issue. That's what it would seem. He leaps all the way through any history and he goes right to the heart of the point. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He lays it out. This is who I'm talking about. This is who I believe him to be. He is very plain about this right from his very beginning. The word gospel is, of course, the word for good news. It, it, uh, the message that he has to bring, and it's a gospel message about Jesus. That is his given name. Christ is his title. And he even labels him that he even knows, uh, uh, confesses of himself who this person is. Mark wants you to know where he's going with this book. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah, and not and more than just that, he's actually the very Son of God. So right at the beginning of the book, he lays down very plainly his effort on what this book is about. So let's jump into the text a little bit and notice that he also, Mark, as he begins this gospel, he begins immediately to quote from the book of Isaiah. Mark 1, verses 2 and 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Isaiah prophesied that there would be somebody that would come who would be considered, in Isaiah's words, my messenger who would come before the Messiah actually came. That there would be somebody who would announce, if you will, that the Messiah was coming. What that would look like, how long of a period of time, we're not sure. But this is the way that Isaiah describes this voice, this messenger. He describes him, this messenger, as one who would be a voice a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now that is a physical wilderness, but it's also a spiritual wilderness, if you want to look at it that way. One who is crying out, I have a message that nobody else is saying. And here's the message. This is the quote. This is the voice, what the voice is saying. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now we know as we read into the text and read further into the text, um, that this is in fact... Um, John the Baptist, who is making this claim, is making this call. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Luke, if I could try not to borrow from the other Gospels too much, but Luke fleshes this out just a little bit for us. The very same passage, a little bit later in Luke, Luke chapter 3, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is a poetic way of describing the voice of the messenger. This is a poetic way of saying, if you want to meet the Messiah, there is a requirement that you have to hear and understand this message before your heart will be ready for the Messiah to come. What is this language talking about? Making your paths straight and mountains being made low and valleys being brought up and rough places being made smooth. What is that? I don't know if you know your heart, but I know mine. My heart has a tendency to desire crooked ways. I know what it is to be conniving, to want my own way. I learned this as a child in diapers that if you wanted something from your parents, you could just yell and manipulate in such a way and you could get what you wanted. Every child innately has the ability to learn crooked ways. We don't unlearn this, we get better at it. 
We learn to connive and scheme, to fudge, to cut corners. We know how to tell little white lies, little black lies to cover up the other white lie. We do whatever we can to keep things the way we want them to be by nature. We are crooked waymakers. We know how to get what we want. The call here is make your paths straight. There is a call to humility in the heart of a person who recognizes that their ways have been crooked. They have been going their own ways. That I need to turn and make my ways straight. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low. What do you do when you know that you've done something wrong? You have committed some moral act against a moral God and you cover it up. Like Adam and Eve with their fig leaves in the garden, you come up with 15 reasons why it's justifiable that you were angry with that person. Why it is perfectly acceptable that you allowed this to happen in your life. Why you did this, you have a reason. And you will pile a reason on top of another reason, on top of another reason, and you will lie to yourself and everyone around you until you have a mountain, a mountain of sin and cover-up trying to keep people from knowing what is really inside you. And you wear that mask, and you wear it well, and you look like you're just a, a wonderful person, but in your heart of hearts, you have things covered up. You have things buried. What do you do to prepare for the Messiah coming? You must be humble enough to make your way straight, to be willing enough to bring your mountains and to tear them down. Every valley is going to be leveled. Every place that you've dug a hole for yourself, every place that you've tried to hide your sin, you are going to bury and you are going to make level paths so that there is a direct relationship between you and God. This calls for a humble heart. This was the voice of John the Baptist calling out in the wilderness, if you want to meet the Messiah, there is a requirement, and the requirement has nothing to do with a physical ethnic positioning of being a Jew, being in church on a Saturday or on a Sunday, depending on uh, your Jew or Gentile. It has nothing to do with what your deeds have been. It has nothing to do with your background or who you are. It's got nothing to do with whether you read the Bible or you've ever been a Sunday school teacher. It's got nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your heart. And he called people not to a believer's baptism. He called people to a baptism of repentance. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was the voice crying out in the wilderness, make your path, make your heart ready for the Messiah. The only way you'll meet him is if you approach him from a heart attitude of humility. If you look at Jesus' life, Mark comes out of the gates with this. If you examine this gospel and examine Jesus' life from a clinical perspective, from a scientific perspective, from let's analyze and let's scrutinize and let's see what we like and what we don't like and let's see how this matches with everything else in history, you're going to miss the point. If you want to know who this Messiah is, it starts with a proper attitude of approaching this in a way, in such a way that you are humble enough to admit that you have a spiritual need. And John called people to a baptism of repentance. The Jewish people knew what baptism was, not in the sense that we do it today as Christians in a New Testament sense, but any Gentile who wanted to become a Jewish person, they were called proselytes, they went through the rite of a Jewish baptism and washings and ceremonies. John borrowed this idea, it would seem, and he called people to get into the river and to be baptized. You know the word baptized. Most of you are good Baptists this morning. It means to be immersed. And they were going to be immersed for a baptism that symbolized a washing away of their sins. It didn't physically do that, but this was their heart attitude. This was an expression of what they knew they needed. And something was going on in the early days before Jesus arrived on the scene. As John came calling out, hearts seemed to be pricked in their conscience. And people were flooding. Listen to the text. John appeared in, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. We don't know 
the numbers that are involved here, there's not, nothing in scripture to say so, but some people have tried to make an effort and they would think that there are upwards of six figures in regards to the numbers of people that were flocking to John the Baptist during this period of time. What the period is, this was not over a day, over a week, over, you know, a, a Saturday afternoon. This was an elongated period of time. John was calling people's hearts to be made right with God, and people were coming and coming. Now, Mark doesn't record it, but you know from the Gospel of Luke that John the Baptist has some interaction with some of the Pharisees who come with a heart attitude that I don't need this because I'm a Jew. John rebukes them and, and, and confronts them because it's all about the heart. And they were baptizing in the Jordan River. This is just an aside, but just to give you a little bit of orientation on what we're talking about. Most of you, I'm sure, understand this. The Jordan River is a river that flies, flows through the center of Israel from the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. It has two names down the center to the Dead Sea. It is um, a very long river. It is shorter if you go in a straight line, but it is quite meandering. And so it is um, quite, it's got some decent length to it. It's not wide and it's not deep. There are uh, chemicals within the water, uh, substances that cause it at times to look very emerald green. Most of the time it is quite muddy and quite um, unattractive. It is not, as I said, it's, its widest point I, th I think is 30 meters. It's not a very deep river. It's not a very intriguing river. But just to give you a little bit of orientation, these people were coming and gathering because God had been stirring their hearts and making them realize that if you want to be ready for the Messiah, it's about your heart being right because there is a spiritual need. Now we give a little vignette here. John uh, the Baptist is described for us. Mark gives us a little quick explanation of him, clothed with camel's hair, wore a leather, leather belt around his waist. Does this sound strange to you? It was strange to Mark. That's why he records it. He ate locusts and wild honey. This is an odd person. That's why this is in there. Because this is, is, gives you that sense that this is a, a person who, you think of an Old Testament prophet. Someone who's living off the land. Someone who is who's living out in the wild. Someone who doesn't have any regard for how he looks. He's not concerned about fine clothing. He's got an, a, a different disposition. His heart, his mind, his focus seems to be in another place, clearly. Before you think it's disgusting to think that he's eating a locust, I personally would rather have some roasted locust with a bit of salt than half the things that people eat on this planet. I would never think I would ever put haggis in my mouth. I don't even want to put caviar in my mouth, which apparently is a delicacy, but I know what it is. Escargot, why do we do this? How is it that we think that's an odd thing to eat when we're the ones eating frog legs and chocolate-covered ants and whatever else we find? In some parts of Africa, monkey brains is a delicacy. Anyways, this boy is eating some yummy food, in my opinion. This is not his complete diet. This is just an explanation of who he is, so you get this sense. This is a very intriguing character. He has a voice about him that has garnered attention and has called people to respond to something brand new. He preached saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I. This is important. Mark adds this in so that we know. John the Baptist did not confess to be the Messiah. He was not proclaiming to be someone important. He was proclaiming to be a servant of God. After me comes one who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. This was part of the culture that if you were to meet somebody, if you were a servant in a home and somebody, a guest came to your home, it was part of your job as a servant, as distasteful as this us to our, uh, distasteful to our minds as Canadians, you would be the one as a servant who would get down and unlace the person's boots or sandals in this case. You would take them off. You would offer them some water and a towel to soothe their hot, dry feet from having walked where they were in the Mediterranean. So John uses this imagery of being a servant, of someone who is paid to help a, a richer person receive his guests. I am not even worthy. I am below a servant. I can't even stoop down and untie this man's sandals. I, he is so far above us. That's the picture that John wants us to see. He is not making any claim 
to anything import, of importance for himself. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is going to bring something that no human being can bring. He is going to bring something that is beyond my scope and anyone else's scope. He is going to give you the presence of God. Verse 9. In those days, what days? The days that John the Baptist is baptizing people, whatever length of time this is. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. I only point this out to you because it's interesting that John, or excuse me, that Mark includes this in his text because Galilee is a region. Nazareth is a town. It's kind of like saying Bracebridge, Ontario, sort of same principle. The region of Galilee is a pagan region, mostly thought of as a, as a Gentile region. Nothing good comes out of Galilee, is what the, the scribes and Pharisees say. It, it's impossible. And this is the stumbling block of where it begins, that Jesus himself comes from a place that is off the map, in terms of being important. In fact, Nazareth itself, not that you need these details, but I thought it was interesting as I was studying this week, Nazareth itself is nowhere mentioned anywhere of anything ever important happening in Nazareth. It's known historically, but in a sense, it never made the news. There is no document of history that ever mentions anything happening or taking place in Nazareth. It is a nothing place. It is a nothing place in a God-forsaken place. And that is the place that the Messiah is coming from. If you want to write a legend about Jesus and make him important, this is not the place you choose to say that he's from. The only reason you would include that detail is because it's true. Because you would never try to get an audience and tell them that Jesus is important and begin with that explanation of where he's from. But what is really curious about this is that Jesus came and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Does that rattle your cage a little bit? Did I not just tell you what the baptism of John was about? It was about people's hearts recognizing their own conniving ways and acknowledging their own spiritual need of being made right internally, not externally, Something needs to change in here. I need my heart changed. I need to be baptized for a baptism of repentance. Why was Jesus baptized? How does that fit with what John was calling people to be baptized for? Why was he doing this? First off, this was not a requirement under any Jewish law. There is nowhere in the Old Testament, in the 612 laws of the Old Testament, that is ever listed that you are to be baptized in any way. So there's no commandment that he needs to do this. What in the world is the reason that Jesus is baptized? We all know that John's baptism was a baptism for repentance. And if you know anything of the character of Christ, as he's explained to us in the New Testament... He doesn't fit that category. Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest. This is a reference to Christ. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So why would a sinless man, a perfect man, need to be baptized, but in a baptism of repentance? Even... Even John had issue with this. Matthew 3, 13 and 14. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Whoa, whoa, whoa. John's even puzzled by this. This doesn't make any sense. Don't you know what I'm baptizing people for? Why are you being baptized? I'm the one who was born in sin. If there's anybody here who needs to repent... You should be baptizing me. I am the human being. What is going on? Verse 15, Matthew 3. Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that's John, 
Then he consented. Wait, wait, what? what? He consented, what, what, why? Because Jesus said it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. <laughs> what does that mean? That's not helping me at all. To fulfill all righteousness. Do you understand that there is a need for us to be obedient in righteousness to the law? Do you know this? That the law itself requires of us, as human beings, anybody who wants to come to God, the law itself requires of us obedience to the law. Deuteronomy 6, 24, 25. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for, all, for good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. How will you be righteous? By obeying the law. Now anybody who is serious with their own heart immediately recognizes, in all honesty, that there's a problem. Because nobody, if you're honest with yourself, has fulfilled the commandments of the law. You do not have the righteousness that is required for you to be right with God. That is the issue at hand. We do not have the ability to do that work of the law. I know what it is to lust, to want something that's not mine, to steal with my eyes, to covet, to take, to, to desire, to, to do. I know what it is to break the commandments of God's law. I cannot produce that righteousness. What is going on? It is to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is our substitute even in the fulfillment of the law. Jesus knew that John the Baptist was called by God as a prophet of God to call people to a baptism. He called them all, anybody who wants to recognize and acknowledge God, come and be baptized. It became, as it were, a command of God. Jesus is going to be obedient to his Father in every command that his Father gives him. Even the command to a baptism that in essence doesn't apply to him, but not being baptized is actually breaking a desire, a command of God. I have sent John, as it were, to call people to be baptized. If Jesus isn't baptized, he is actually walking in disobedience to God. And when he is baptized, he begins on a journey of continued obedience to his Father to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law that you cannot keep. Jesus obeyed his Father because you can't. He becomes your substitute living an obedient life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake, he, that's the Father, made him, that's Christ, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. How are you righteous before God? By doing the works of the law. God treats Jesus the way you should be treated. God punishes Jesus the way you should be punished for failing to meet the requirements of the law. But then what happens? He now treats you the way he treats Jesus for fulfilling the requirements of the law. He becomes your substitute for righteous living. And it begins with his obedience to be baptized. Romans 5.19 For as by one man, this is Adam, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, this is the obedient life of Christ, one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Christ became our substitute, 
not just for being the one who was punished for us. He becomes our substitute as the one who lived a perfect, obedient life that is now credited to the account of every heart that comes in humility and faith to receive that forgiveness of sins. Jesus lived this obedient life. It's repeated to us over and over again in the gospel. John, for example, John 4, 34, Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I am only here to be obedient. John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven. This is an audacious statement. I've come down from heaven. This guy's either Looney Tunes or he's God. I've come down from heaven not to do my, my will, but the will of him who sent me. This, this is an audacious. I love the statements of Jesus. You could park here for a week and, and, and meditate on this. this. This man is saying something that nobody in history has ever said. I'm come from God. God sent me, and all I'm doing is whatever he tells me to do. Woo-hoo! Time for a white jacket with nice long sleeves. You can give yourself a hug in a padded room. Or, that's really what's going on. And everything about his life pointed to the fact that this man was the Son of God. And in fact, he lived the perfect, obedient life that you and I cannot live. Jesus is our substitute in our righteousness and it was fulfilled right from the beginning that he obeyed the Father even by being baptized with a baptism that in essence didn't apply to him. But he needed to be obedient to his Father and live that perfect life for you and for me, obedient to every command of God. Back to our text, Mark 1, verse 10. When he came up out of the water, now depending on if you're Presbyterian or Baptist, Presbyterian coming up out of the water means he's stepping up onto the land after being sprinkled or poured. If you're a Baptist, you recognize that he's coming up out of the water after being, being baptized. <clears throat> the text can be read two ways, unfortunately. And he came up out of the water. That's what we see here. Immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open. This is an important aspect of what is taking place here. Jesus immediately obeys the Father, and now the seal of Jesus' Messiahship is about to arrive. This reason I point this little phrase out to you of heavens being torn open, not only does it put a picture in your head that you wonder what does that look like, what does that mean? There's only two times that this word is used in the New Testament, schizo, it means to rip, to tear, to, and the only other time it's used is in the temple at Jesus' Uh, crucifixion when the veil is torn in two it is something that is rent completely ripped open that's such a perfect image and I can't help but wonder if Mark isn't borrowing from the cry of Isaiah's heart in Isaiah 64 verses 1 and 2 this is the cry of the Jewish people they have been living under oppression they had been living desiring to see God move Oh, verse 1, Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. We want you to be present. Oh, God, that you would tear open the sky and you would burst onto the scene. If you would come, you would change our situation. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood. How long does that take? And fire causes water to boil. There's going to be some action here. There's going to be some heat. There's going to be something that happens here to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations might tremble at your presence. This is the cry of the Jewish people. God, would you come and do something? And what does Mark say? At Jesus' baptism, the heavens are rent open. It's as if he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, God has just arrived. Guess who's on the scene? Guess who just showed up after all our centuries of crying out for God to come? The heavens were torn open, the text says, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. That text better than we do. All we know is this. The Spirit descended on him like a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, but he came 
like a dove. Was it a dove? It would appear it was a dove. What? How strange is this? That a, a bird. What do we know about a bird? A dove, I mean. It is often thought of as, as a bird of peace. Why? The dove. It's just a bird of purity. It's a bird of gentleness. It is fitting in so many ways. But what, a, what an odd thing from our perspective. But here we have this beginning of a representation of who this Jesus is. This is the coronation of Jesus. If you're still tracking with me, this is a complicated text. I appreciate your attention this morning. This is Jesus' coronation. This is him being announced as the Messiah. This is his crown, if you will, that now places him before all these people into a different category. The heavens have been torn open. The Spirit comes and rests on him. He is now anointed of God publicly. Probably know this. Point this out to you. The very title, Christ, Jesus Christ, it is a title that means anointed one. Why do we use that title of him? Because he was anointed at his baptism publicly to present to everybody, this is my beloved son. In fact, that is the very voice that comes. A voice came from heaven. Now the Father speaks. You can't help but see the Trinity in this. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is the touchstone beginning of Jesus' ministry. Why does Mark start his gospel not telling us about Mary and Joseph, not telling us about an angel coming and pronouncing, announcing the birth of a Messiah, not telling us about a journey to Bethlehem, not giving us a lineage and a background and a backstory? Why? Because to Mark, I've got to tell you from the very beginning who I'm talking about. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let me tell you how it was announced. John the Baptist came. He told everybody, if you want to get ready for God, get ready for the Messiah, get ready for what God's going to do. You've got to respond to God in your heart. You've got to be made right with God in your spirit. You have to have a humble attitude to deal with what your problem is. And along comes this man, out of Galilee, if you can believe it, from Nazareth. He gets into the water. John's like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? And he does the very thing that fulfills all the commandments of God. And when he comes up out of the water, he's actually ordained. There's a coronation that happens. He is the monarchy of all monarchies. He is saluted by God himself. Let me tell you, I don't need to tell you the back this is who we've been looking for this is our messiah this is the touchstone moment that begins the life of christ that changes everything through the rest of this gospel in fact this moment is so important that that jo jesus uses this moment to remind the pharisees of his authority mark 11 We'll probably look at this text when we get later on into Mark. They came again to Jerusalem. This is Jesus' disciples. And he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. They said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you authority to do them? In other words, who do you think you are? You are from Nazareth in Galilee. You walk around through the temple cleansing it like you're some important person. You're talking about God like he's your father. You're doing these things on the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath laws. Who do you think you are? People, do you not know who he is? That's Jesus' attitude. Did I not tell you? Were you not, did you not hear about what happened at my baptism? What does he do? Jesus said to them, I ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. Then he takes them. You want an answer? Then ask me, answer me this. The day I was baptized, what happened? What happened at my coronation? Remember this? That's what he's asking them. John's baptism, was this something John made up? Or was this a command of God for everyone who was going to be obedient to God to follow through? Was this baptism from John or from God? And they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe him? 
we say for man, uh, they were afraid of the people. They held that John was really a prophet. They knew they were going to be stoned on the spot if they said, well, it, it, you know, John just made that up. What? John wore camel hair and, and a leather belt and ate locusts and honey. That's, nobody does that unless you're a prophet. I mean, it's mind of the people. John the Baptist came as a prophet from God. You're going to tell me now who's a man? Now, what do they do? They answer Jesus. We don't know. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, if you do not acknowledge what took place at my baptism, then I've got nothing to say to you. If you do not recognize what took place when I was baptized, if you do not see that this was a declaration and a proclamation and this was a physical demonstration, an audible demonstration, that I am not just a man, if you don't receive what took place, I got nothing to say to you. You don't understand me. You'll never understand me. You'll look at me. You'll scrutinize me historically. You'll analyze my life systematically. You'll look at me scientifically. You'll have your little times in universities talking about which gospel's legitimate and which part of the gospel's okay to read and what part of Jesus' life and where did he really live and who did he really marry. And you're going to make up all kinds of your own stuff trying to come up because you, right from the beginning, have ignored and denied the very thing that I have said about myself, that God has said about me, and that was proclaimed publicly. This is Jesus the Messiah. He came as a substitute for your sins and my sins. He came as one who would live a perfect, sinless life because you can't and I can't. He came as one to fulfill all righteous demands of the law for you, for me, and anyone who would receive this Christ on his terms with a humble heart will know what it is to know this Christ as he is and as he came. And that is how Mark starts his gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God.